All right. It's 404 still and people are still coming in. 504. There we go. Mark, you want to start us, sir? When we when we talk about 505, do we mean the beginning of 505 or the end of 505? I, I don't know. Um, we'd, we'd better start counting quick. Oh. Well, either way, I would like to welcome you all to Lip Balm number 77, uh, still going strong since the beginning of the pandemic. And we're delighted to have everyone here today. Tonight, our featured readers are Linda Paston, Rose Solari, Jean Nordhaus, and Karen Alinea. And we are delighted to have them. They're all uh, hailing in from uh, the DC slash Baltimore area. Um, uh, but um, before we commence with a wonderful feature, we shall do a little uh, warming up of the mic ourselves. And first on my list, of course, is my co-host, Jonathan Penton, who found an unlikely stories in 1998. Um, since then, he's lent his editorial and management assistance to many literary and artistic ventures, such as Mad Hat, um, the New Orleans Poetry Festival, Rigorous and Big Bridge. In 2005, he founded Unlikely Books, which publishes three to five books of poetry and or experimental, interesting other writing per year. He's organized literary performances and performed himself across the United States. His poetry books are Last Chap, Blood and Salsa, Painting Rust, Prosthetic Gods, Standards of Sanity, and the free e-chapbook Backstories, which you can download from Jeffrey Side's Argotist eBooks. Hi, JP. All right, thank you, Mark. So as the regulars have heard me say many times, I'm not terribly prolific. So what I do most weeks is I read something that we've recently published at unlikelystories.org. Um, and this week I'd like to read you something by Carol Dorf, who I believe is in the room today. And let's see if it'll come up. Sorry, I usually print these out, but I'm not at home. Okay, this is My Problem with Statistics by Carol Dorf. And it begins with a quote, out of 100 people living in constant fear of someone or something, 79, by Wislawa Zamborska. My Problem with Statistics. In my childhood, there were fathers to fear and nuclear war, radiation, this was before children were given set of killing the thousand paper cranes. So no wonder we felt hopeless in spite of the cans my grandparents kept in the basement. The footage of the Shoah that appeared in school didn't help. Did they want to scare us into keeping our papers at the ready? My friends are out demonstrating again. I'm proud of them, but I'm in my house grading tests. What use are writers? Math teachers have something to say. But the problem with statistics is that most of the time, approximately 87% of the time, knowing statistics increases uncertainty. Actually, I made up that number, but given the time, could come up with one that most would agree on. The doomsday clock was just a metaphor, hands creeping closer to midnight. Then in the 90s, we stopped worrying so much about nuclear war, despite all the wars with their lists of the dead and dirty bombs that kept on leaking radiation long after the explosions. In an emergency, don't forget to turn off the gas. There are a lot of books to pass out to the children before the end times. They may need a minimal grounding in mathematics for which I recommend the number devil, though that story cleaves to number theory, while statistics is the mathematics of our dead of burdened lives. One and two, one and three. So many arguments involve the quantitative, demand a qualitative explanation. The list of fears grows, even though the children deserve the 98% of the hope left in the bottom of the vessel. Okay, again, that was the problem with statistics. My problem with statistics, excuse me, by Carol Dorf, uh, which we just published at unlikelystories.org. All right, right now it's my great pleasure to introduce Cassandra Atherton, our co-host. Cassandra is an award-winning writer, scholar of prose poetry, and professor of writing and literature in Melbourne, Australia. Her most recent books of prose poetry are Pre-Raphaelite, Leftovers, and Fugitive Letters. She is currently writing a book of prose poetry on the atomic bomb with funding from the Australia Council. I've read it, it's wonderful. Cassandra Crow wrote Prose Poetry, an Introduction, and the Anthology of Australian Prose Poetry. I haven't read, read them, she hasn't sent them to me. She is commissioning editor for Westerly Magazine. Cassandra, will you read a poem for us today? 
Yes, I will. Absolutely. Uh, I've been commissioned to write 21 poems on atomic bomb survivors for a project here in Australia. So I will read one on Sadako Kurihara, who is um, an amazing, amazing woman. She was four kilometres north of the epicenter. She writes about it, but censorship destroys her lines with thick black boxes and overscoring. Her notebooks from high school are filled with haiku, now new poems rupture traditional forms. The blank page is ground zero. She sees beyond its edges and past Hiroshima. Her testimony burns. She is midwife at the birth of the atomic bomb. Her pen is heavy. In free verse, she reminds us all we are sitting on black eggs. And now I would like to introduce the brilliant Mark Vincennes. So please join in if you uh, karaoke style know some of the information in his brilliant bio, which I'll read. Mark Vincennes is an Anglo-Swiss American poet, a fiction writer, translator, editor, publisher, designer, multi-genre artist and musician. He's published 16 books of poetry, including more recently, Leaning into the Infinite, The Syndicate of Water and Light, Here Comes the Night Dust, Einstein Fleet a Mouse, and the little book of Earthly Delights just out from Spite and Dival. Vincenzo's newest collection, A Brief Conversation with Consciousness, is forthcoming this fall from the brilliant Unlikely Books, very exciting. An album of music, ambience and verse, Left Hand Clapping is forthcoming from Tree Torn Records. Vincenzi is also a prolific translator and has translated from the German, Romanian and French. He's published 10 books of translations, most recently, Unexpected Development by award-winning Swiss poet and novelist, Klaus Matz with White Pine in 2018. And it was a finalist for the Cliff Becker Book Prize in 2016 for translation. His translation of Klaus Mertz's selected poems in Audible Blue is forthcoming from White Pine Press in the fall. Vincenzi is editor and publisher of Mad Hat Press and publisher of New American Writing. He has lived all over the world from, yep, Brazil to China to Iceland to India. He was born in Matilda Hospital on the peak in Hong Kong, but now lives on a farm in rural Western Massachusetts, overlooking Herman Melville's Greylock Mountain and where there are, this is a tricky one, people. Acorn weevils, orgochlorus sweat bees, and bold jumping spiders than bees. That was sensational. One of my favorites. Mark, please read for us from your amazing oeuvre. And grazie. Uh, but you forgot to say more, right? So more acorn weevils, etc. Yeah. Oh, more. <laughs> uh, isn't that isn't that something to do with Charles Dickens? Yeah. Um, anyway. So uh, here are two very short poems from uh, a collection I've just finished. It's called A Splash of Cave, cave Paint. Um, and these two are the last two sections of a long poem called How to Skin a Weasel 21 Ways. And this is 20, after the age of innocence. Do you imagine you really see me? My old instrument is well aware of the contours of your hand all that tissue and bone, all that fissure and fizzle, the lines drawn, if in a circle will return in the contours of the cell, all that separates matter from the band and their careening crooner in his cloak of invisibility. And this is 21, after the party. In the age of invisibility, we stride out toward the dawn, seeking all known forms, bakers, undertakers, chartered surveyors, citizen who punch holes, denizens of injection molders, the bipolar, the maladjusted, they who creep out under a faint lamplight, lamplight. the drifters, sifters, layers of layers of plank plankton, fungal spores, daily chores, stifled in the closet of the laundry room, tethered to the kitchen, the bed, the multiform, all these contours uncountably punctually held in shape by years of that nautilus on a platform, pelagic, jurassic, cretaceous, jurassic, triassic, undeniably uniform. And just to, to sum up, um, this one is called The Unicorn in My Bed. 
um, and it's um, from from a collection I've been working on called More Animal Poems. The unicorn in my bed. Oh, good God, what can I say? Who can I write to? I'd love to tell my sister about this, but maybe she's too much of a prude. I found him draped in his rainbows, white and golden fleeces, a little crown over his head, over his horn or his narwhal. He shuffled himself into my bed. He was smooth. He was Sinatra. He was Jimmy Dean. What can I say? There were worlds and anti-worlds, a lamp that's far too bright. A newspaper opened it at any date, a munching of pumpkin seeds. Given the state of my own biometrics, I think I'll call it a day. Thank you. And I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Carol Lalonde Aliena, who, who Mad Hat Press is very proud to have published one of her books, um, The Anima of Poor Bowls. Um, but she's also the author of eight poetry collections, including uh, How We Hold On from Broadstone, the uh, Gertrude Stein invents uh, a jump early on, her jazz opera, and with the composer Bill Banfield, uh, the premiered in 20, 2005 uh, in New York uh, by Encompass New Opera Theater. Welcome, Karen, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say and, and read us. Thank you, Mark Vincenz, Cassandra Atherton, and Jonathan Penton for hosting my accomplished colleagues, Jean Nordhaus, Linda Poston, Rose Solari, and me this evening on your Lit Bomb Poetry Series. I'm excited to be reading here this evening with Jean, Linda, and Rose, and thank you for the warm up because that's always interesting to know about your hosts. Um, the theme of my reading is girl talk. And for me, that means sass versus balderdash. Diana O'Curran refers to a modern day Diana the Huntress. This poem is part of my opera, Gertrude Stein invents a jump early on. And yes, Gertrude as an adolescent had a rifle. After her mother died, she and her brother Leo went out in the Oakland Hills and shot birds. Diana O'Coron, she was a flippy lady, a real sixer in a deck of nines. She knew the handle from the muzzle, the click of the cock from the squeeze of the trigger. She listened, an authentic spoon tuner in a forest of forks. Her ear was better than a metal detector, sharper and juicier. Her mouth tasted the purple plum. In short, she was, had more life in her than the entire city of New York. The parrot that spoke to Jane Bowles is part of my Mad Hat book, The Anima of Paul Bowles. In this poem, Jane and Paul Bowles are on their honeymoon in Costa Rica. Both Jane and Paul were American writers. Gertrude Stein considered Paul one of her protégés. But in a parallel universe, Jane, who never got to meet Gertrude because of World War II, would have been a more suitable Steinian. The parrot that spoke to Jane Bowles. Badapuma, badapuma rap, the parrot said to Jane, not, hi, where is your money? Not, Hello, take me home. After the sunrise horseback ride, clip clop, with 15 cowboys through the Costa Rican jungle, trees laden with howler monkeys, the big black male roaring, swinging from his tail, 
tiny babies clinging to their mother's tips, Jane and Paul were offered one of seven young parrots. Nonsense, Jane squawked. I don't break up families. But Badupo perched alone on a man's fingers. So they bagged him in a burlap sugar sack along with their 27 trunks and Paul's typewriter. Jane heard him say, don't pinch me. But Paul retorted, he'll never learn English. The parrot ate their peppermint toothpaste, one Russian novel, and Jane's tortoise shell lorgnette, much to her delight. That gift from her mother, she never liked it anyhow. As a teenager, before I knew anything about Gertrude Stein, I was a poetry snob. My prose poem, Girl Talk, plays a prominent role in my latest book, How We Hold On. It's from Broadstone Books, this year, as a matter of fact. The second section of How We Hold On is titled Girl Talk, and I will read several poems from that section. Girl Talk with an epigraph from Edna St. Vincent Millay as follows. But the rain is full of ghosts tonight that tap and sigh upon the glass and listen for a reply. In the early 60s, my party girl mother, not even a high school graduate, asked her eldest child, she had six, if she, uh, that would be me, liked Edna St. Vincent Millay. No, I replied in keeping with the intellectual snobism of the day, tilting my chin to the sky and rolling my eyes. I added, no one likes romantic poetry. But I was a teenager and my mother, not even two decades ahead, who reveled in mistaken identity, making her my slightly older sister, would not be put off. How about Rumi? Why and how she came to ask these questions never occurred to me then. Had she read these authors? authors? Had someone else, not likely her husband, dear dad, not the sire of my making, who hid in the upstairs bathroom reading about relativity, he too lacking a high school diploma, who had, who had read these poets, their poems, certainly not my mother with her love of fashion magazines. Still, why was she asking and did she believe I was a microcosm of her life, a way to know herself? Or was this just the best girl talk she could muster with a daughter who read books she did not understand? Next, I'd like to, for you to meet my mother as a teenager. The title of this poem, Hope, refers to the famous gemstone, the Hope Diamond. Hope. According to the legend, a curse befell the large blue diamond plucked from the third eye of an idol in India. My mother wore the Hope Diamond, that exquisite gem said to curse all who touched it. Picture this a society renegade, Evelyn Walsh McLean, entering a ward at Walter Reed, removing from her neck what she called her lucky charm, letting this legless private, that handless sergeant, and finally my teenage mother, a candy striper in love with fashion, feel the weight of that intensely blue stone that if set in the sun would phosphoresce red. 
Imagine that necklace purchased in Paris from Pierre Cartier by the headstrong young woman who eloped against her family's wishes with the heir of the Washington Post fortune. Envision my raven-haired, high-cheekboned, ruby-lipped mama who married five times, the lonely girl who cherished the letter her daddy wrote from a battleship in the South Pacific, wishing his princess Rona a sweet 16, and she standing with a long line of kings, Louis XIV, Louis XV, Louis XVI, who all wore this crown jewel. Maybe the curse in touching those 45.52 carats accounts for why she was never satisfied. What was hidden hides in plain sight a quote from the Jamaican poet Claude McKay as follows. I know the dark delight of being strange, the penalty of difference in, a, in the crowd, the loneliness of wisdom among fools. The quote runs down the right-hand side of the poem and uh, the subject matter talks of things also hidden in plain sight. Some of you might recognize this as a golden shovel in format. What was hidden after my house by Claude McKay. In 1959, when I was nearing 12, what did I know about living free, justice, the American way, except dark tales from Europe, a girl's delight, the diary of Anne Frank, full of hope and petulance, she being prisoner in a secret, strange living arrangement behind the office bookshelf, a penalty exacting death should workers of her dad's warehouse hear difference from expected clatter, noise in a suspect place, alerting the Gestapo spies. So I would crowd in with ironing board and the maid to discuss Anne's loneliness. Viola, learned woman of color, college degreed, wisdom, my folks, high school dropouts among her white employers, surely fools. The last poem uses the form invented by Washington DC Truth's, Truth Thomas called a skinny. The first and last lines use the same words, but in a slightly different order. Lines two through nine are one word lines with repetition in lines two, six, and nine. Normally the poem might look like a C, but I took the liberty of making that a double skinny, so it looks more like a square. Westlaco, Texas, a dark comedy. My sister lives in a noisy neighborhood. Bang, duck, border police, gun running, death, quick. Bang, duck, drug deal business cards, explodes, played, bang, duck, in a noisy neighborhood, my sister lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, so Karen, uh, tell us about your newest projects. What are you, what are you working on at the moment? Uh, I'm working on an opera with Janet Peachy, who is here tonight in the audience, uh, called uh, What Price Paradise? It's about the love story of uh, uh, Jane and Paul, and many of the poems that uh, are in this book with your lovely piece of art on it, um, they're uh, part of this opera. And I'm also working on a uh, unannounced, but soon to be announced, 
big project that uses tender buttons and poems in response. So some of the poems are mine and some of the poems are other people's. Yes, I think I owe you one of those, don't I? <laughs> you do indeed. <laughs> uh, and you will, you will get it first thing Monday, I swear. Um, the next, next we hear from Jean Nordhaus, um, whose six volumes of poetry include Memos from the Broken World, The Porcelain Apes of Moses Mendelso Mendelssohn, wonderful title, um, Innocence and My Life in Hiding. Hiding. She's published work in American Poetry Review, The New Republican Poetry, among many journals, and served for eight years as review editor of Poet Law. Welcome, Jean. Thank you. Um... That was wonderful, Karen. It was just terrific to hear you. And I thank our hosts. I really enjoyed your poems. Uh, thank you so much for hosting us. And I see a few familiar faces uh, among the tiles um, and some of people I haven't seen for quite a long time. So you know who you are and hello. I'm gonna start uh, with a post pandemic poem um, about our days uh, living and communing as we are now in the house of Zoom. It's called Face to Face. Like days on an advent calendar, we wait at our separate windows, gazing from a kitchen, a bedroom, a den, into the common void. Some have considered the mise-en-scene, setting art on the wall, meaningful objects and books on the shelf. But what I like best is the glimpse of the unguarded rooms beyond. A bathrobe slung on the back of a door, a hanging pot in the kitchen, half blocked by your shoulder. The first stare of a flight that leads to a place that is hidden. For who can really grasp the mystery of another's life? Winter is coming. Now we see through a glass, dark visions of trouble and smoke. But when can we meet face to face? Alone and together, we wait in our separate rooms in the one human house. Uh, since we are meeting under the aegis of Lit Balm, um, I thought I'd read um, a poem about some of the comforts of literature that literature provides. Um, this is this one was uh, I wrote many years ago um, about my mother after she was widowed, and the fun of it was writing was getting to reread Robinson Crusoe. A widow reads Robinson Crusoe. Islanded, he must have been surprised as she to find herself alone in a season when even the winged seeds of the maple come paired. She admires his ingenuity and how bereft he never lacks for comfort, how from the wreckage of hope he framed a habitation, fortified it with a palisade of still green sticks that rooted in a self-renewing wall. Slowly, taking pains, he taught himself to fire cooking pots of clay, grind flour for bread, inventing agriculture, rediscovering animal husbandry and tailoring. He built a life not so unlike the one he'd left. Once from a felled tree, he carved a boat so big he couldn't drag it to the water. He started over, dug a smaller vessel he could launch, for time was what he had. 28 years, long enough to marry and to raise a child. It's night, the telephone lies still. Beside her looms the empty bed, unmapped and dangerous as sleep. And so she pulls the Afghan close, settles her glasses on her nose and reads. The next is a more recent poem um, from my own experience of widowhood, widowhood 
specifically of selling my husband's car after his death, selling the Porsche. For over a year, it lay in the garage, bedded beside my homely Subaru, long, lean, muscular, beautiful, bought in the joy of remission six summers ago in an access of hope. It was there when I drove out each morning, the battery long dead though once it roared, and there at night when I slid in beside it, docking snugly in my narrow slip. I was tough, sorting, tossing, warding off, but when the driver came with his dinosaur tow truck, hauled the body up the ramp and drove away, I went inside and had to sit, and a shrill trail of unfamiliar hoops rose from my throat. It rose from that primeval cave where all the winds contend. Aboriginal death wails, ululations of abandoned brides. Who is this woman, I wondered? Who are all these women howling through me? The next um, one was uh, written some years ago on the morning of my birthday, uh, sort of trying to think about what it must have been like to be born. And I recently rediscovered it. So I thought it would be fun to read again, although it's not a fun poem. On my birthday. All last night, my mother labored to bring me into this world. And this morning, just before dawn, I was born. My arms and legs trembled like cornstalks in wind and my navel burned. I couldn't speak, I couldn't see, but blind and groping, I knew I had suffered a loss. It was November, then as now, countries were at war. The rain had ended and the sky was damp with tears. I gazed into the underwater light, drew a cautious breath, then another. How could I have known then that the struggle would repeat itself, that every morning I would turn my face again to the floodgates of light and every night lie down in darkness and wrestle with my angels to be born. And the last two poems I'm going to read, um, one is new and one is older, and uh, they're both about writing. You're supposed to never write poems about writing, but of course we all do. Uh, this is the new one, it's called A New Notebook. <clears throat> How much nicer the notebooks look before I write on them, before they are scribbled with messy life, with errors and corrections, crossouts and second thoughts with arrows tracing the scattered mind's digressions and detours and substitutions, the spidery letters splotching the page with ambition, spinning scrambled webs of fact and fantasy. And how clean and full of possibility the pages seem before that first mark falls from the pen, like snow before a footstep has broken the crust like a mind washed clean of artifice, or the eyes of an infant as they open for the first time on an endless sky. And um, I'll end with another poem that also involves some um, weaving, like wild geese. Like wild geese pulled north on a thread of song, we make ourselves up as we go. Following a line, we cast ourselves, arrow aimed at a life we imagine. Inventing this house, the painted furniture, closed wall, flesh-colored garden, dovecoat and sky, sigh of wind, the blue-tailed lizard on the walk, just stepping out of its skin like a word out of silence. Inventing the tree above the roof, the cream and yellow butterflies brushing its leaves without hunger, and the couple who walk beneath its branches, 
half formed melody he hums. The tree of language in her skull, seed, stem, and leaf, the bird in the pond and the bird in its branches. Delicate network of signs and stars we steer along with, uh, with awkward vowels of longing. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Um, Jean, tell us a little bit about your influences. Um, who are your favorite poets? Oh, um, well, I guess I, I was a Germanist in my, in my earlier life. And so I loved uh, both Brecht and Rilke. They were very, <laughs> very different writers, but I loved them both. And um, thank, thank you, Karen. I, I grew up as a teenager loving Edna St. Vincent Millay, and my mother was a great fan of Edna St. Vincent Millay. And I think I grew up in a language, in a family where we loved language. My parents read poetry to me, and those are the most important in influences, I think. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jean. Really appreciate your reading. Um, next, we hear from Linda Paston, whose 14th book of poems, Insomnia, was published in October 2015 and won the Townsend uh, University Prize for Literature. She's twice been a finalist for the National Book Award, and in 2003, she won the Ruth Lilly Prize for Lifetime Achievement. A Dog Runs Through It was published in May of 2018, and almost an elegy, new and later selected poems is due out next year. Welcome, Linda. Thank you. Am I unmuted? You are, you are. Okay. Um, it's always very special to read with friends. So I enjoyed reading with Jean and Karen, and I hope I get to know Rose since we're all local. Um, because the weather has finally turned cool and it's September. I thought I'd start with some autumn poems. This one called Autumn. I want to mention summer ending without meaning the death of somebody loved or even the death of the trees. Today at the market, I heard a mother say, look at the pumpkins, it's finally autumn. And the child didn't think of the death of her mother, which is due before her own but tasted the sound of the words on her clumsy tongue. Pumpkin, autumn. Let the eye enlarge with all it beholds. I want to celebrate color, how one red leaf flickers like a match held to a dry branch and the whole world goes up in orange and gold. And contradicting that order, not to uh, equate autumn with death is a poem called Bronze Bells of Autumn. Although I've made a kind of peace with those I loved who are already dead, bronze bells of autumn in their minor key toll for the losses still ahead. The weather tells a narrative of change. The wind prepares a path the geese will take. This frost is beautiful and yet it kills. The harvest moon drowns in the lake. I love the dark, it moves so gradually, but love still more, all it will erase. These swarming leaves, this pungent smoky air, the youth you were, your aging face. And Skipping ahead a couple of months, this is November. It is an old drama, this disappearance of the leaves, this seeming death of the landscape. In a later scene or earlier, the trees like gnarled magicians produce handkerchiefs of leaves out of empty branches. And we watch. We are like children at this spectacle of leaves, as if one day we too will open the wooden doors of our coffins and come out smiling and bowing all over again. Um, my new book, Almost an LG, New and Later Selected Poems, will be coming out late next year. And I thought I'd read a few poems from that book. Um, the first 
the title poem, Almost an Elegy, and I wrote this for Tony Hoagland. Your poems make me want to write my poems, which is a kind of plagiarism of the spirit. But when your death reminds me that mine is on its way, I close the book, clinging to this tenuous world, the way the leaves outside cling to their tree just before they turn color and fall. I need time to read all the poems you left behind, which pierced the darkness here at my window, but did nothing to save you. And the poem's called Sting. A bee stung the palm of your right hand, or did you touch a nettle? There was a swelling, the burn of pain, a poison flower blooming in the flesh, and neither ice nor baking soda helped. You carried it around, right hand and left, as if it belonged to somebody else, and you were angry, not at the possible bee whose buzz was all you knew of it, not at the nettle, hidden scourge of the summer garden. It was the wound itself that angered you, an early soldier in the army of afflictions waiting for us, even in the innocent grass. Um, many people that I know now are downsizing from the houses they've lived in for years. And I have done that as well, but I wrote this poem right before I actually downsized. And this is called Plunder to a Young Friend. On a day of windy transition, one season to the next, you spoke of helping your mother close her house, of the choices you had to make, what to discard, what to keep, as if it were your childhood itself waiting to be plundered. You kept a Persian rug, all reds and golds, to walk on every day, keeping the past alive under your feet. Those nested Russian dolls you played with as a girl, grandmother, mother, daughter, four bentwood chairs wrenched from their table. I listened thinking I'd be next to try to crowd a lifetime of things into a shrinking universe of boxes. I've started dismantling my life already, throwing out letters from people I remember loving, choosing among books, this one to stay, that one to go, as if I were a judge sentencing some to death, the rest to the purgatory of the emptying shelf. Perhaps I should simply burn it all. But don't we live on in what we've left behind? In the fading twilight of Kodak, in our sterling knives and spoons tarnishing on a grandchild's casual table. Don't these become a kind of museum of the afterlife? The pharaohs had it right. They took their whole world with them, vases and chests, gilded statues, jewels, plundered perhaps, but not for a thousand years. Nefertiti's tomb has never been found. This one was called Class Notes after receiving in one week um, news from my high school, from my college, from my graduate school, all listing the people that had died since the last newsletter. So this is class notes. My high school class of 1950 is disappearing over the edge of the world, a snowless avalanche. Rosalie of the pancake makeup, Alex who outran us even towards death, three Susans, two Davids, and a Roger. When I see our class representative's name on an incoming email, I think of how families must have felt during World War II when they saw the Western Union bicycle approaching. And I remember all of us lining up in gym class as captains chose their teams. 
The line would dwindle until on one leg than the other, I was standing almost alone. Maybe whoever is doing the choosing now thinks I would be no good at dying. Well, this new book will be selected poems and I do hope that I live long enough to have a collected poems one day. Meanwhile, I have a poem called The Collected Poems. They take you through my life one poem at a time, memories beast raging through the pages, inventing as it goes, the slap that was really a caress, the tears no more than a mirage. My actual childhood was a sapling in the forest of years, yet it shadows these poems so that my mother's death, for instance, sheds its leaves over everything. So many leaves. For years, I wrestled with syllables, with silence. My stories were love and its hazardous weather, feathers of snow, of birds ghosting the windows, sharpened needles waiting in every innocent haystack. Now I rest in a hammock of words, waiting for the sun to rise again over the horizon of the page. And I'm gonna end with an older poem that's really an autumn poem again. Um, it's called Something About the Trees. It's a pantoum, which is a Malaysian form based on the repetition of lines from one stanza to the next. So you'll hear every line twice. Something about the trees. I remember what my father told me. There is an age when you are most yourself. He was just past 50 then. Was it something about the trees that made him speak? There is an age when you are most yourself. I know more now than I did once. Was it something about the trees that made him speak? Only a single leaf had turned so far. I know more now than I did once. I used to think he'd always be the surgeon. Only a single leaf had turned so far. Even his body kept its secrets. I used to think he'd always be the surgeon. My mother was the perfect surgeon's wife. Even his body kept its secrets. I thought they both would live forever. My mother was the perfect surgeon's wife. I still can see her face at 30. I thought they both would live forever. I thought I'd always be their child. I still can see her face at 30. When will I be most myself? I thought I'd always be their child in my sleep. It's never winter. When will I be most myself? I remember what my father told me. In my sleep, it's never winter. He was just past 50 then. Thank you. A million thank yous, Linda. Um, so um, what are you working on at the moment? I only work poem to poem. I never have a big project in mind or a book in mind. So I'm just working on the next poem. And you, you mentioned that, that you're, you, you'd love to have your collected poems uh, put together, yeah? Oh, someday, <laughs> right, right. I think I'll let my daughter do that when I'm gone. Got you. Thank you so much, Lila, wonderful. Uh, next, we hear from Rose Solari, who is the author of three books of poems, the Last Girl, Orpheus in the Park, and Difficult Weather. Uh, the one act play Looking for Gwen Guinevere, in which she also performed in a novel, A Secret Woman. She's lectured and taught widely in both the US and the UK. In 2010, she co-founded Alan Squire, publishing a small press with gigantic ideas. <laughs> welcome, welcome, Rose. Thank you. Thanks everybody. What a, what a, uh, an intimidating lineup you ladies are, my goodness gracious. Here I am with all these all-stars. Um, thank you and thanks Mark and the whole team. It's, this is my first acquaintance with Lip Balm and this is really wonderful. So 
I'm going to start with a poem from my most recent book, The Last Girl, and then I'm going to read some new stuff. Um, this is a prose poem. The middle section of my book, The Last Girl, um, is all poems about islands in various places in the world. And this, um, this one is set in the US Virgin Islands on the island of St. Thomas. Some of you might recognize some of the locations in here. And uh, as I said, it's a prose poem. It's called My Expatriate Life. Ellen came to make a movie, stayed for the Danish pot dealer half her age, whose eyes are as blue as, but much less hopeful than Gulf water. Jake has a warrant out in St. Pete's. Olivier would be a dead man in Cuba and Melinda will never return to New Orleans. Each one says I should just stay on, get a job at one of the beach bars slinging coconut rum and five kinds of ceviche. Sunshine every day, no rat race here, imagine. So I rent two rooms with a tiny bath above Melinda's Red Hook shop where she sells wood carvings and batik sarongs to tourists. Olivier helps me paint them a pale yellow that holds flower-like the morning sun. Jake lends me a futon like the one from my grad school days. Ellen gives me a set of old pans for my two burner stove. After a month, my skin loses its tourist pink. Four nights a week, I work the Blue Macaw Bar in Muller Bay, mostly with Ellen. When I cover for her, she gives me perfect fat joints that untie every knot in my body, send me swaying into a reggae sky. Mornings I swim, then write until it's time for work or friends. I set some goals, I finish my book. Well, no, that's not what happened really. What happened was that I went to the island and made four friends in three days. I saw how quickly a life could spring up around me there if I wanted, and instead of saying yes, I said, not yet. Then I went home. For a while, I carried my island life in the cup of my mind, waterboyed, all sparkle and gull song, mine to retreat to against those multiple losses, mom dead, dad dead, and alongside my fought for marriage, unraveling slow and fast. I told myself it was only a matter of time and I'd cut off my stateside ties, make myself a new story. I don't remember just when I knew it would never happen. Melinda had moved to LA by then and I was three phone numbers past the one Jake used to drunk dial. I don't know what happened to Olivier or Ellen. But sometimes in summer, the smell of rum and sunscreen and lime flip a switch and there I am all bright on the screen in my mind, dancing on sand with Rasta boys hanging my bikini to dry every night on my little balcony, pouring drinks for tourists and writing my island poems. I've been writing, um, my new poems seem to center up a great deal around music. Um, my mom played the piano and sang very beautifully and um, filled the house with music when I was growing up as my dad did with with books of poems. So in that way, it was a very fortunate childhood. And I've been really enjoying exploring some of the music um, that I loved growing up and looking at it in new ways now. So this poem is called Metal. Um, and the great Richard Peabody uh, published it in one of the recent issues of Gargoyle. Um, I think everybody here is old enough to get most of the metal rock references. So we'll see how it goes. Metal. It cannonballed into ninth grade, creating tribes with sacred symbols. The rush kids spraying 2112 on their denim jackets, the ACDC heads in perpetual mourning, scrawling back in black on the walls. It brought you, a boyfriend who loved Aerosmith, painted their winged logo onto a cape 
to wear over your precious glitter tube top. You picked Led Zeppelin for shiver and thrum, but also for plant who years before you knew the word androgyny wore ruffled girl's shirts above the significant bulge in his jeans. Sure, there was folk rock too and prog rock and some of your friends had already found jazz, but nothing raged as pure as honest metal, a sound that hurt the way your new girl body hurt as it lengthened and swelled and began its monthly bleed. Though you'd yet to have sex in an elevator or shake anyone all night long, those songs were your channel, howling at your parents as you never could. Are you angry? Have I frightened you yet? Do you love me? And uh, just as a footnote, you know, if this ever ends up in a Norton anthology, uh, Sex in an Elevator is an Aerosmith song and uh, Shook Me All Night Long is of course ACDC, but you all knew that. <laughs> I've also been playing lately with form and this, this poem appeared in a recent issue of Fledgling Rag magazine. It's a palindrome poem. So it has nine lines that then repeat themselves backwards. Um, and I'm really grateful to Lee Hinton um, for publishing there. Yeah, I had four poems in last year's issue of Fledgling Rag, and this was one of them. Catherine Young, an amazing poet and translator and friend of mine, um, wrote an introduction a few years ago to the second edition of my first collection, Difficult Weather, in which she pointed out that in all three of my full length collections thus far, there's an image of a woman alone playing the piano. And not only was I astonished at that, but uh, I think there's going to be one in the next book, too. Um, this is for my mom, and it's called My Mother's Nocturne. She is nostalgic for a past she never had, in some imagined city washed in Botticelli light. Hammers of meaning, her nimble fingers sure on the keys. Outside of art, she thinks, nothing really happens. While we invent, are we still living? Clocks slow, then stop. How time delivers its blunt insults. See her beneath the skin that dries and loosens. Where did she tuck it? That self who had no chance. Did she tuck it? That self who had no chance beneath the skin that dries and loosens. Where time delivers its blunt insults, see her still living. Clock slow, then stop. How nothing really happens. While we invent, are we sure on the keys? Outside of art, she thinks, light hammers of meaning, her nimble fingers, in some imagined city washed in Botticelli, she's nostalgic for a past she never had. I think, I think I have just enough time for one more. I thought I would like to end with something maybe comforting, a little cheerful. I know we're all struggling right now. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but this ongoing cancellation of live events and inability to see each other in person has really been getting to me. It's really, really been getting to me. And I was gonna read a new poem that's rather sad, but I thought I'd end with this one instead. It starts sad, but there's, um, there's some resolution at the end. And thank you all for coming. Thank you all for listening. Thanks for inviting me. I will be tuning into this show regularly now. This has been a really terrific experience. Thank you so much. You really brightened my holiday weekend. This poem is called Here. Um, in case you can't tell already that I'm a beach lover, this one is set um, on the island of Chincoteague. And me being me, there are references to two opera, two operas and a ballet in here, but I don't think that matters. Their heroines are all tragic. That's all you need to know. Here, Hungry for solace that orphaned autumn you drove to the ocean, but it too seemed sunk in grief. Hard rain stabbed the sand. 
the wild ponies shook their manes and sighed. Still, you didn't weigh down your pockets, walk into the ocean. You had one last beer in the cooler, a small bowl of hash in the car. The drive home was all grip and skid, every guardrail temptation and thunder and orchestra guiding you out of this life like Aida, Lucia. Sorry um, about that. Please go ahead. Uh, okay, should I? I'm just going to pick up that sentence again, if that's okay. Sure. Okay. The drive home was all grip and skid, every guardrail, temptation, and thunder and orchestra guiding you out of this life like Aida, Lucia, Giselle. Crossing the bridge, you thought you might soar in your tiny tin can of a car out over the whole of that bay, relieved at last of the burden of this life. I wish I'd been there beside you. I wish I'd taken the wheel and let you weep. I wish I'd thought of a story to tell you, not sappy, but promising, the sort you'd want to stick around for, though maybe I did, because here we are. Here we are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rose. Um, Rose, tell us, tell, tell us about what Alan Squire Publishing is up to recently. Oh, um, we've got some wonderful books out this year. Um, we got hit a, a bit uh, with a bit of a challenge with COVID. Last year, we published Elizabeth Hazen's second poetry collection, Girls Like Us, which launched in March. And then, as you know, everything shut down. Uh, so we moved some things around. But just this past spring, we published a beautiful uh, full-length collection by Catherine Young called Woman Drinking Absinthe. And our next poetry collection will be out in this next spring. And it's by Saida Agostini. It's her first full length collection. And it's called Let the Dead In. It's going to be a Rumpus Book Club feature next March. Wonderful. So we're keeping the poetry moving, dear. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Rock and roll, as they say. Yes, um, that too. <laughs> or sex in an elevator. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 10,000 feet in a, in a 737. Well, that's why I became a poet. <laughs> <laughs> because of 10,000 feet or? No, Aerosmith. I'm joking. I'm joking. Sorry. Um, actually, there's a really um, what's what's the name of the lead singer? Um, Stephen Tyler, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, there's a beautiful um, rendition that he does of Dream On. Actually, um, that I saw on YouTube. He's actually coming out of a rehab clinic or something at the time, and right. he just plays he plays keyboards and he sings. And a couple of other other guys from the rehab clinic are playing behind him. Oh and my it's, God. it's like the best version of Dream On I've ever heard and seen. Well, um, I know what I'm Googling tonight. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you for telling me that. I love my old rockers. <laughs> oh, don't we all? <laughs> um, well, anyway, in, a, in any case, this has been a wonderful feature with Karen, um, Jean, Linda, Rose. Thank you all so much for this wonderful reading. Um, and we're going to move on to the open mic section of our reading now. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Jonathan Cassandra to uh, work the details out of that. But I'll be back uh, shortly to um, cap up the show, which uh, I think has been a wonderful one. Thank you so much. It has been a wonderful show. Thank you, Mark. All right, so we've got a full open mic tonight. We've got a bunch of new faces in the crowd. So I thought I'd go ahead and let uh, six people read in the open mic. I'm going to go ahead and let people unmute themselves because if we've got any Zoom bombers at this point, they've been patiently waiting an hour to yell obscenities at us. Um, and we're going to go ahead and start with Igor, who I believe is calling in from Macedonia. The open mic's one poem each. And Igor, are you there? Would you like to read us a poem? Yes, uh, I'll start right now. So the name of the poem is Doctrine. Miss M wiped the stone stairs, which are probably 10 centuries old, with palms, which were gently pressing. The rag was tattered from too long usage. That one bucket, and this time was full of water only, yet she achieved that extraordinary effect of purity with one squeeze only. 
so gentle with the palms of her exhausted hands, the effect was so noble as the swaying of the ash trees above the orphanages of the still unborn, which unborn arise from the influx of the sinless peace shaken by the day after, conceived by all inside of us, which honestly is and will never be something that is not, nor something that will never be, but will last with camouflage glow of its perpetual deception. Her posture is probably completely haggard beneath the worn out robe which pinky green patterns are fully faded, which is translucent, showing the skeleton of which we say is dying, though once was living. Her movements are sharp, dignified. If she didn't survive the horrors of dictatorship, she would have become lady. So she believes in the temple in front of her by which will soon be swallowed with intensity of a sickness which becomes a paradise while futureless. Thank you, Igor, that was wonderful. Igor, what is your background there? That's really interesting. <clears throat> now I'm at my uh, PhD, actually at my second uh, PhD in, uh, mm -hmm. in cultural studies and uh, my, my um, Subject is Faulkner. <laughs> ah, and, excellent. Yeah, I have. Right. Uh, I'm uh, one of the most productive uh, writers in the region, so I'm writing long. Uh, I re I have uh, uh, written thirty plays, for example, and uh, I won this year the prize for best. A poem of a hopes, which is an um, option for better living, with my poem um, a "Body Double," and this is the the first time I actually received a a prize with some money. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I hear you. All right. Next up is Lonnie. Lonnie, will you read us a poem today? I absolutely will read a poem for you. Thank you. Um, and just to let you know, it's Lanny. Like Lanny, Annie. excuse me. No, you're fine. Uh, so I'm just going to read a poem from my new book, Good Morning to Everyone Except Men Who Name Their Dogs Zeus. This poem is called, I Can't Talk About It. My gut, that vengeful city of insomniacs, swaps tales of trauma with the loose twilight. Terrified of optimistic things like the sun, it drowns my sealed lips in caffeine. I survive on muddy irrigation and anxiety, hollowed and hungry, nibbling on fingertips that stretch for perfect words and refuse to let anyone within spitting distance of this soft underbelly. My tongue, that talented freight train has been known to tap out the rhythm to anything goes but when anything went, everything went, and I'm going anywhere and everywhere. Are you following? I can't talk about it. It's like a scream that keeps getting caught in my throat, but the scream is a pair of men's hands and his cufflinks snag my vocal cords, just like his fingers snagged my closed eyes, dragging me from a piece I will never have again. My mouth, that deceitful poet, spoke forgiveness, but how can I forgive my skin collapsing in on itself? My bones drop away, even as I stand here. And the only thing I can do to stay together is shove myself into pockets of an oversized sense of loss because I swallowed his apology and his three paintings of a single taupe flower, as if jeering at the femininity he stripped from me as if he knew this was the fifth time my body has been deadened in this way. My womanhood, that lost and weakened wheel squeaks, even as I weep to keep things moving along. Every day I am misrepresenting myself. Am I the apple, the serpent, 
or the whole damn rib cage, protecting a man who refused to protect me. For years, I've been howling on the inside, raking my soul red and raw with the need to tear this story out of my body. And I still can't talk about it. Thank you. Um, I just want to apologize. Usually I do a trigger warning of sexual assault and I forgot. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, that was okay. Yeah, that was wonderful. Yeah, so many great lines, so many memorable thank lines. You. I was trying to keep track of them and I failed. Yeah, just oh, many wonderful lines. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'd like to hear from Carol now. Is Carol still here? Hi, I'm here. Um, thanks for reading that other poem of mine during the intro. And um, it was really a pleasure to hear all the features, um, especially um, Linda Paston, who is on the other side of the country. So I haven't heard you in person until this time. Um, this is the Jewish month of Elul, where you sort of reflect on what your part of things is. And this poem is up in the current unlikely stories also. Name the responsible party. The apple is a fruit well known for malfeasance. Just when did you taste it? You tasted fallen persimmons ripening into alcoholic blots. Of course it is your fault. You should have played the long game. Instead of keeping lists, you planted all those fruit trees. The hooting outside could be an owl or just a mockingbird. You watched insurrectionists hooting and mocking civil order. Yes, I know pecking order is a combinatorial question. That's what they feared, recombinations of the pecking order. Threats and more threats. You can't scare me. In a song that is in a bad refrain to hold off threats, you have all those postcards in search of stamps. Reopen the post office, fend off the stamp of fascism. Some fruits are well known for malfeasance. Thank you, Carol. Another Another wonderful mix of the imagistic and the um, and the political. Um, how long have you been uh, sending poems to Unlikely Stories? I don't even remember. Um, for a while, and you've published me a few times, and I've always liked your taste in the ones that you've chosen. You know, it's like so hard to find places that are interested in both experimental language and politics mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, so... Um, I really appreciate your work. Um, I, I have to tell you guys, there's another one of my poems in this issue that uses the word hegemony. And it is like impossible to publish a poem that uses the word hegemony, but um, I appreciate that. Well, you, you mix them very well, thank you. Um, next up is Jackie. Jackie, will you read for us tonight? Yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to read a poem from my book, Man in the Morning, which was published um, in 2020 by Kelsey Books. It's called The Scripture of My Life. Embarrassing episodes compiled in short narratives could fill a white Bible embossed with blue letters. Browse verses one through 20 for the list of personalities tried out in my teens, like jeans in a dressing room discarding bell bottoms for boot cut, low waisted for high rise, size six for size 10, only to find them all uncomfortable. Subsequent verses record hours of teach yourself guitar. Did she freeze up for everyone else? Can everyone else still hear me? While watching TV, journal entries on poems never finished. Can you still hear me? Hello? Um, you, you did break up for a minute there. Um, do, you, do you want to go ahead and start from the beginning? We, we lost a good bit, I think. Okay, but can you hear me now? We can't hear you now. Okay, the scripture of my life. 
Embarrassing episodes compiled in short narratives could fill a white Bible embossed with blue letters. Browse verses 120 for the list of personalities tried out in my teens, like jeans in a dressing room, discarding bell bottoms for boot cut, low waisted for high rise, size six for size 10, only to find them all uncomfortable. Subsequent verses record hours of teach yourself guitar while watching TV, journal entries on poems never finished, hot tears over an early college rejection, a cheerleader's comment on my prom dress, a boyfriend who impregnated a classmate. It's all there, including my silent mouth, when an English advisor offered salvation for my Jewish soul, followed by months of pouring out the story in tall red cups at every campus party. Verse 25 tells how I waitressed half blind, too vain to wear old glasses. Verse 40, of too few calls home after daddy's first heart attack. Don't read verse 56 where I spilled coffee at an interview, snapped at my mother-in-law, backed a car into a fence. Youth shouldn't be reread without wine on a Saturday night. Still, I have faith in the way one verse begot another until my present good fortune of standing on the mountain with the tablets in my hands, not sorry at all, that my days of dancing with a golden calf are gone. Thank you. Thank you. That was fantastic. Um, yeah, as Cassandra just said, what a great open mic. And now we've got size 10 jeans and Aerosmith. And um, yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we're ready. And I, I also wanted to thank you, Jonathan. You, I've, I've had some poems in, um, in Unlikely Stories as well. So thank you. It's oh, nice thank to, you. to meet you. Good to meet you. All right, I believe up is next up is a regular, Indrin. Um, Indrin, are you gonna read for us today? Yes, I would love to, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I such an honor uh, to read with this group of featured today and, and, and the open mic, yes, it's, it's very strong. I'll have to produce a decent poem. Um, look, I have a new book called Blue Window, Ventana Azul, it was published by Dialogos Books, Will Lavender, New Orleans Center. Uh, I wrote the book in Spanish, Ventana, so, so I'm gonna read uh, the Spanish and then the English. It's just 11 lines, so it's 22 lines total, but both the languages included, so it's a, a double feature. Viaje. Estamos de viaje, cada uno por su cuenta, tú hacia la montaña, yo al mar, tú con nuevos amigos, y con tiempo para reflexionar, yo a ver a mi hija el fruto del pasado y a unos amigos todavía en este lado del mar. No sé qué provecho sacar del contraste montaña, mar, amigos nuevos, una hija alta y bella, casi un adolescente a punto de despegar. ¿A dónde? ¿A una nueva ciudad? ¿Al futuro que le espera otra vez sin el padre? A mí no me gusta lo impermanente y darme cuenta del límite de la costa. ¿Qué opciones me quedan? ¿No regresar? ¿No dar algún consejo a este ser vivo al que ayudé a caminar? ¿Guardar el silencio cuando cada memoria quiere hablar? And now in the translation of Jennifer Ratman, Trip. We are on a trip, each one of us on our own, you towards the mountain, I to the sea. You with new friends and time to reflect. I to see my daughter, fruit of the past, and a few friends still on this side of the sea. I don't know how to take advantage of the contrast, mountain, sea, new friends, a tall and beautiful daughter, almost an adolescent, ready to take off. Where to? A new city, to a future that awaits her again, without her father. I don't like the impermanent and realize the limit of the coast. What options are left for me? Not return, 
not give some advice to this living being whom I helped teach to walk. Keep silent when every memory wants to talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Indrana, gentleman and a scholar. Um, Indrana, when did that book come out? I haven't seen it. Just come out this uh, in July, so last month, yeah, or oh, a month, six weeks ago. How is Bill, by the way, is, uh, and how are you? Are you, you guys are all right? Um, I'm a few hours away from New Orleans. Okay. Uh, okay. Bill, I believe, has um, Bill's house just got power again. I know that. Okay. Um, no internet, but he does have power again. Um, I'm not sure if he's in, if he's back in town. I assume he is. Um, I'll be headed back to town Wednesday, I think. Okay. Good luck. Thanks. Thank Thanks you. Everybody. All right. Last but not least, Renee. Renee, will you read for us tonight? Is Renee still here? She's here, but she's muted. There we go. Okay, yes, thank you. Um, thank you for a bit of peace tonight. And thanks, Karen, for introducing me to Lip Balm um, uh, and the unicorn in my bed. Uh, I'll never think of them the same way. I really enjoyed that. Okay, your oxygen seeking fuel. You won't blaze the spit, the sizzle, the crackle a barefoot walk in summer rain, clothes damp on the floor, train sounds as legs entangle. You see in him the spark, but fire seeks its own path to something more primal than flesh. In the beginning was the word and the word becomes poetry. Music slips from its lyrics. Coltrane and O'Hara cross paths with God. Thank you, Renee. Um, uh, what was it more primal than um, more primal than flesh? Um, the word. Uh, the, oh, the word. Yeah, in the beginning was the word. That's. Mm -hmm. what. Yeah. How did the line go? Um, in the beginning was the word. Oh, yeah. what for more primal than flesh? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but fire seeks its own path to something more primal than flesh. flesh. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. All right, that's your open mic. Uh, Mark, Cassandra? Yes, thank, thank, thanks so much, everybody. That, that, that was really, truly wonderful. Um, and, you know, it's also always wonderful to get these new voices coming in here. I mean, from Macedonia, no less, for example. Igor, thank you for joining us. Um, but of course, many, many thanks to Karen, Jean, Linda, and Rose for a fantastic feature reading. Um, and let me just tell you about what's coming up fairly shortly. So uh, next, next Saturday, September 11, we have DeWitt Henry, Bob Heeman, Cindy Hockman, Ralph Culver, and John Wessick. Um, some of our, our old friends. And I, I know they're planning to do a big scam on my bio, so let's see how that goes. <laughs> um, on September 18, we have Dan Kiasson, uh, Maureen M. McLean, Sandra Lim, Katie Peterson, with guest MC David Blair. So do join us for that as well. Um, it should be pretty amazing. Um, and just to cap off, um, I've been thinking a lot about mushrooms lately. Um, and so this little poem, it's from my new book, uh, The Little Book of Earthly Delights, which just came out from Spite and Bible Press. It's a tiny little book. The idea is that you can actually put it in your back pocket and take it with you into the woods. Um, so this is called Listening In to the Mushrooms. The body relaxes gathering mushrooms, but how late I have come. The trees are fraying while the earth leaks. People are eating each other, and yet bellies are empty. Against the wind, dust is climbing the sky. The moon holds our sorrow. The heart is ready to drink. Shadows linger in the east, and not a single mushroom to be seen. So, I don't know, optimistic, not so optimistic. Um, I'd say there are mushrooms everywhere, and the mushrooms will continue uh, along with our friends, the cockroaches, long after we've gone. Um, but either way, this was a wonderful night of poetry. Thank you so much, everybody, and uh, sending you out lots of love um, even-headedness, uh, love-mindedness, and 
beauty. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Amazing night. I'm trying to end this meeting and I'm having trouble with um, my mouse. So if you're still here. Thank you, Jonathan. Goodbye. Goodbye.